I would like to invite you to take a look at that picture. As you know, I spent just recently two weeks in the Dominican Republic. I went there to manage a mission trip with some great people from an academy, Mount Pisgah Academy, a mission project organized by Cher Him. And one day, a young man from there, a guy from one of the local churches, told me, Pastor, I would like to take you somewhere to see something. When you hear that on a mission trip, you want to be cautious because you never know where somewhere is and what something is. So I said, how far? He said, well, 10, 15 minutes. So I made my calculation, half an hour, all right. Let's go Thursday morning. Thursday morning, the guy, the guy came and uh, looked for me at the hotel. I came out, I jumped on his motorbike behind him, and off we went. We were driving, riding full speed, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes. And it was like a whirlwind or a tornado, the dust all over the place, because he took me out to the fields, vast banana fields. And at one point, I couldn't take it any longer. I yelled to him, brother, my allergies, this is going to kill me. So he squeezed the brakes. And now he was going slowly. And I had a chance to experience firsthand the serpent curse. You know the serpent curse? Dust shall you eat. <laughs> I was eating it, you know. <laughs> Anyways, after like 30 some minutes, we got to the first colony. That's where that picture was taken. Then from that colony, we went to another colony, and there I took some pictures of some buildings. These buildings were built decades ago as homes for some field workers because, as I said, there are huge, vast banana plantations in those areas. And you may think those buildings are now abandoned, and yes, you're right. They have been abandoned for quite some time. But in 2010, there was a terrible earthquake in uh, Haiti. You remember those days, probably. And around that time, some people crossed the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, because you know there are two countries on the same island. and. Uh, because nobody was waiting for them with some pretty houses in the Dominican Republic. They took shelter in those buildings. So yes, in those buildings, there are people living, real people. Look at that bedroom. That's a bedroom. And the same bedroom also has another corner that is, I think, the kitchen. 
And if you think uh, nobody lives there, yes, there are people, actual people living there. You can look at those kids, and that's a father. And those people live under those circumstances. I have a question for you. Do those people appeal to your mind or to your heart? Mind or heart? Both. Good. What do you think? Looking at those pictures with the eyes of your mind, will those people ever live in a pretty home like yours? If you look at them with the eyes of your heart, will the, the answer change at all? Can you see with the eyes of your heart those people living in totally different circumstances? Ephesians chapter 1. Starting with verse 15, it says, Therefore I also, the Apostle Paul says, After I heard of your faith or faithfulness in the Lord Jesus and your love, that's agape, for all the saints, your faithfulness and your love to all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What is your prayer, Paul? Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. So I want the knowledge of Him for you. That's what I'm praying for. I want divine wisdom. I want the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I want you to understand, to have a knowledge of Him. Verse 18, how? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know I put there in brackets the Greek word cardia. So I would like to ask you if the Greek word there is cardia, is the translation accurate? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know. Is it accurate? What is the word cardia? What does it mean? Cardiology. That's where it comes from. Cardia. It is the heart. So if it's the heart, then is it about the eyes of your understanding? Yes, it can be if you believe that you understand with the heart. If you believe the heart has understanding, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may no, if there is knowledge in the heart, then yes, the translation is accurate. Let us pray. Lord, we are somewhat puzzled by what the Apostle Paul is praying for. And we pray that you will enlighten our hearts, our cardia as well, that we may know, that we may see what the Spirit wants us to see. In Jesus' name, amen. The challenge in this verse is that classically or traditionally, science has taught us that what is called cardia, or the heart, is nothing but a pump, a muscle, 
a piece of muscle that pumps blood in all the blood vessels through all the body. Is that correct? Well, that's what science has been teaching for quite some time. Interestingly, though, in recent years, that classical view has been reviewed to, to some degree. Because if in the past there was a lot of talk about the IQ of a human being, what is an IQ? Is the intelligence quotient? These days, there is a lot of talk about EQ. What is EQ? Emotional quotient. And um, you probably heard about Daniel Goleman. He was the one that popularized the concept of emotional intelligence. There's obviously a change of focus in today's society from something that seemed to have the, the supremacy of human existence, of human life, the mind, towards something else that is named sometimes, sometimes it's not named. Interestingly enough, the Bible has been telling us for quite some time that the heart is more than just a piece of uh, muscle. Look, for instance, at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues, spring the issues of life. That's the NKJ. The NIV says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Oh, I knew every intelligent activity flows from here, from the mind. So then, does science teach the right way? Or does the Bible teach it the right way? You know, there has been a concept even in theology. And some of you, I'm sure, heard about it. We were taught that whenever you read your Bible and you stumble upon the word heart, in your mind, you think it's not heart, it's the mind. Have you heard that? Because, they said, in those days, they thought the center of the human being is the heart. But now we know. It's not the heart, it is the mind. So when the Bible says, Son, give me your heart. It's actually saying, uh, Son, give me your mind. Really? I struggle with that concept because in the Bible I find words that can be translated accurately with mind. For instance, the Apostle Paul uses mind Many times, for instance, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when he says, you be transformed in the what? In the renewal of your mind. And he uses the right word for, there, for, for, for that, knows it's mind. But then there are instances when he uses the word heart. Does somebody try to convince me that they were so mixed up or messed up in their language they didn't know when they did a dissection on a corpse maybe of an animal they didn't realize the brain was inside the skull and the heart was in the chest well interestingly science is looking carefully now at the heart because in the area of the heart, they have discovered a constellation of neurons that very much resemble brain cells. And they speak that this center, this other center of the human being can be another source of intelligence. It can see things that 
the mind cannot see. And it seems that the human being is built by the Creator masterfully in a way that you can see some things and then you can see some other things. When you think about reality, when you analyze what is happening around you, it's one thing to capture the picture with your mind. And your mind will start analyzing and uh, you may go in a certain direction. You may find some answers. But that, that does not mean that you will act upon it. You will do something about it. And I don't want to fight science here because I see science moving softly in a more biblical direction, at least some aspects of science. But this is what I found. In 1999, there was a guy, Dr. Paul Purcell, and he wrote a book, The Heart's Code. You can check it out. This is a famous, famous neuropsychologist. And what he did is he counseled and looked carefully to people that have received a new heart, that were recipients of a heart transplant. And those people, some of them at least, report that with their new heart, they also received things they had never signed up for. Oh, that's disturbing, isn't it? <laughs> Just think about it. How many of you write uh, from uh, the left to the right? I, I, I imagine some of you can write from the right to the left, because there are some writings that are the other way around. Anybody can write? Okay, good, good. Now just, just imagine, your natural way of writing is this way. And uh, you go through a transplant and you wake up and your reflex now is the other way around. <laughs> Pretty creepy, huh? A lady that uh, woke up after the transplant and was craving for beer and chicken nuggets. <laughs> Things she never liked before. And uh, they did some research and they found out her heart came from a motorcycle guy <laughs> that loved beer and at the place of the accident, in his leather jacket, they found what? Chicken nuggets. <laughs> then another guy, another woman actually, very peaceful, very calm, very quiet, when they were watching in the house, they were watching the football match, she would go away. She couldn't even stand it because those people were loud and did the craziness. She goes through a transplant. And when she comes back, she loves football. She roots, she yells, she swears. Everybody is appalled. Yeah, and... And, and some, uh, some of the people think she went wrong. What happened? Well, something happened. Another case. 47-year-old man, not a singer. Music for him doesn't really exist. After the transplant, he listens to classical music. He hums melodies that he didn't know before. It turns out he got the heart of a 17 years, year old uh, boy who was walking home from his violin lesson, was hit by a car and killed. Interesting stuff. And this is my favorite. After 42 years of marriage, 
This guy, he's not a romantic. He never wrote a word. He doesn't have time for sentimentalism. After the transplant, he comes back. And lo and behold, he starts writing love letters and poetry to his wife. Uh, some of the ladies may be praying now, Lord. <laughs> do it for me. <laughs> Again, I'm not here to challenge science or any plan. What I'm doing is I'm pointing to the Bible. The Apostle Paul is speaking to Christians in the first century in Ephesus. And this is what he says in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. So he speaks to the faithful, he speaks to the saints, those that are in Christ Jesus or in him or in love or in the beloved, those that have listened to the word of the gospel, those that have believed in Christ Jesus, those that have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, he speaks to them and he says, I pray for you guys. What is your prayer, Paul? Verse 18, I pray that the eyes, the ophthalmos, ophthalmology, you know what that is? The eyes of your understanding, well, cardia, the eyes of your heart being enlightened that you may know. And you can see in the NIV that, yes, indeed, it is translated with heart. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know. And there are all kinds of expressions we use, like, I love you with all my heart. Is that the heart or the mind? I knew it in my heart. Is that the heart or the mind? I speak from my heart. Are you speaking from your heart or from your mind? I follow or you follow your heart. Is that the heart or is the mind? It's, it's pretty confusing, isn't it? If you read what Paul is saying, it doesn't seem that confusing. Because you know Paul uses mind some other places, but here he clearly uses heart. So let's take him seriously. Because it seems that the Apostle Paul may know what Blaise Pascal, the French uh, scientist and writer, expressed in the 17th century. He said, le cœur a ses raisons que la raison ne connaît point. The heart has its reasons which reason knows nothing of. And this is not a stupid guy. This was a scientist. And he noticed some things happening. So Paul goes on and he says, yeah, I pray that this happens to you. That the, the, the eyes of your heart, so it seems that the same pair of eye can be connected to the brain, to the mind. But it, it somehow, I don't know how to explain that scientifically, but it connects to the heart. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding, your cardia, your heart being enlightened, you may know. So there is knowledge happening there. How? You may know what? First thing. You may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the hope of God's calling? And the word there is klesis in uh, the Greek language, classes means calling, and is the same root from which ecclesia comes. You know what ecclesia is? Church, ecclesia, ecclesia, which means ex, out, kaleo, call. It means calling out. It means that God calls people out. So Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, that you will see, you will know the hope of God calling those that he calls. Is there hope in what God is doing when he calls people? 
How many of you have ever heard about Pandora's box? You know what it stands for? Uh, that's not a biblical story. It's a mythological, a Greek mythological story. So take it as a mythological story. I'm using it as an illustration. The story says that Zeus, the supreme deity, gave Pandora, the first human woman, a box. Actually, it was a clay pot. And told her never to open it. Come on. <laughs> so she took the box and she said, well, I'm not going to open it, but I'm going to look. So she lifted the lid a little bit and all those troubles, all the evil things started invading, coming out of the box. So when, when she saw that, she got scared and put it right back. One single thing remained at the bottom of the pot, and that was what? Hope. Hope remained inside. Interesting story. Sorry, ladies, I know you are not like that. <laughs> but here is the point. When God calls people, we are, you and I, when, when God called us, that's, that's what Paul says, I want you to, to have your eyes, the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you understand the hope. You see, you can know the hope of God calling. When God calls somebody, when God called you, when God called me, or maybe right now, if God is calling you, if 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 you have not moved out yet, God is calling you. Why is He doing that? Because in all fairness, we are like a Pandora's box. Haven't you noticed that in our sinful reality, if somebody takes our lid off, all kind of troubles come out? That's a reality. And in vain you put the lid back, the problem is there's no hope left inside. In chapter 2, verse 12, the Apostle Paul expresses that same reality, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having how much hope? No hope. And Paul says, I pray that you will know the hope of his calling. Why? Because in your sinful state of heart and mind, when God calls you, he sees hope, even if looking with the eyes of your mind, you would not see any hope there. Then guess how does he look? There was a broken woman rushed into a living room and started to shower somebody's feet with her tears and wipe those feet with her hair. And she was at one point kissing those feet. And she... She was, she was in the center of everybody's attention. People looked at her and they said, if that guy was a prophet, he would know there is no hope in this woman. And you know, in the Bible, a prophet is a seer, somebody that sees. In other words, if that guy could really see he would know there is no hope in this woman. What does he want? Well, guess what? In spite of the fact that you could not see any hope in that broken clay pot. When Jesus looked at that person, he saw hope. He saw it there. And he called even her. Another day. There was a guy hiding in a sycamore tree. 
and uh, Jesus saw him. And I need the kids to help me tell me what Jesus told the guy in the sycamore tree. Jesus said what? Zacchaeus, you come down. But master, don't you see there is no hope in that corrupt tax collector? He just robs everybody. He just takes away every valuable thing from people. And yet, in spite of the fact that you could not see any hope there, Jesus sees hope in that broken clay pot. Maybe there is a way of looking at reality that we sometimes miss. Maybe Paul has a point here when he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, that you will know the hope. You will know the hope of his calling. Yes, there is hope. He sees hope even where you cannot see hope. But there is a way if your eyes, the eyes of your hearts are enlightened by the Holy Spirit, you will see hope even where other people cannot see hope. And then he goes on and says, I pray that the eyes of your heart being enlightened, you may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance, where? In the saints. If you remember anything from my last sermon from the book of Ephesus. You may remember that there, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we are told, we have an inheritance in heavenly places. Let me emphasize that. It is us, it is us that have, we have an inheritance there. But this verse doesn't say that. Can you see the difference here? This one says, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your hearts will be enlightened, that you will know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The focus here is not your inheritance there. The focus here is his inheritance here. Because when he takes Pandora's box over, he transforms that box into a treasure box. And now you don't have all those troubles coming out. You have a treasure box. Yes, Paul says, I pray that God will enlighten the Holy Spirit will enlighten your eyes, the eyes of your heart, that you will see the riches or the richness of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Well, when somebody gets baptized, we see that person as a treasure box, don't we? We just look at that treasure box and we say, oh my Lord, how beautiful. And then there comes a hurricane, a tornado, an earthquake, an invasion of the enemy, a war indeed. And you look at the treasure box. Let me ask you and give me in your heart an honest answer. Do you still see the riches of the glory of his inheritance in that saint? Do you still see the riches of the glory of his inheritance in a fallen saint? When uh, we were in Florida, one year there was a hurricane that uh, made landfall and it destroyed our fence, the fence of the property all around. 
But we also had a beautiful mango tree, a glorious mango. Mango trees are glorious, just for you to know. And that glorious mango tree was put down. So one day some strong men from my church came out to help us with the fence. And I told them, guys, uh, I need you to help me do a mango revival here in the backyard. <laughs> mango revival? Uh, just imagine seven strong guys, big muscles there. And they said, pastor, whatever you want. Want us to take it out? Because half of the roots were still inside. But it was leaning all the way down. So what would you do? Well, your first instinct is take it out. We couldn't do that. We needed a mango revival. And they helped push. At one point, one asked, how far do you want this, us to push it? <laughs> yeah, we can push it too far. But it is a matter of choice in a moment like that to decide whether you want to see or not any glory in that fallen tree. Take that tree as a human now. Paul says, I pray that your eyes, the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. That you will see the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, pastors, elders, ministry leaders. When you look at the local church in general... And when you look at individuals in particular, when you look at the global church in general, and then when you look at individuals in the global church in particular, can you still see any richness of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And I'm asking this because I'm hearing very vocal preachers that Tell us the reality that they can see with the eyes of their mind. I have the impression they have never looked or have not looked for a long time with the eyes of their hearts. Because they have gotten to the conclusion there is no hope and there is no glory. It's all gone. And the Apostle Paul prays and says... I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened and you will be able to see. To see the riches of the glory of His inheritance right there in that clay pot. Yes, sir. Yes, Pastor Joe. Right there in that broken clay pot. And Paul says, I'm praying for something more. Verse 19. I pray that you will know what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. Please notice something there. I put in brackets... The Greek words Paul uses, and if you count them, you can see that there are four Greek words there that can be translated into English with the same exact word, power. First, you have dynamis, which means dynamite. Then you have, what? Energia, which means energy. Then you have kratos which means democracy, the power. And then you also have iskus, which means, well, it just means power. But do you understand what Paul is saying here? What 
play on words he creates here? In a rephrased way, you can say what Paul is trying to convey this way. I have a personal translation there, verse 19. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will see or you will know the exceeding greatness of His power according to the power of the power of His power. What kind of power is that, Paul? What kind of power is that? He explains, verse 20, it's the power which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. And what else? 21, For, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in that which is to come. Verse 22, And He put all things under the feet and gave under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What power is that? Well, it's the exact power of resurrection. So Paul is saying, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, that you will see working in the saints, working in those that are called, working in those that have listened to the word of the gospel, those that have believed in Jesus Christ, those that have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I pray that those that are in Him, those that are in Christ Jesus, those that are in the Beloved, those that are in love, their eyes will be enlightened so that they will be able to know the power of the power of the power of His power. What power is that? It's the power of resurrection. The problem is, if the eyes of my heart's heart are not enlightened, I will miss it. Because you may look at somebody, you may be even praying for somebody from among the saints, and you have the impression nothing is happening. When in reality, when nothing is happening, something is happening. But if the eyes of your heart are not enlightened, you may miss it. And Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your hearts will be enlightened and you will catch it. You will see that resurrection power working in the saints. Doing the transformation. Doing the healing. Doing the resurrection in some cases. There is a story written by one of my favorite writers. A French writer, his name is Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. He wrote the book, The Little Prince. Anybody read it? It's a, it's a book written to kids or for kids, but actually it's for the adults. Because what he does after World War II, he pulls the curtain away and speaks about the nonsense of war, of fighting against one another, of humans going against one another. And in that story, there's a little section when the fox speaks to the little prince the little prince had tamed the fox. And this is what the fox says. Here is my secret. A very simple secret. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. 
What is essential is invisible to the eye. Now listen, under no circumstance am I trying to preach or suggest that now you should close the eyes of your mind and from today on you should only look with your heart. That would be extremely dangerous. Amen. That can create a disconnectedness from reality that can take you down a path of no return. What I'm preaching about is we don't want to miss this dimension. Because in all fairness, if we looked only with our mind, sometimes we would take our kids and beat them up to the point where they cannot even breathe. You're not in agreement. You don't know those impulses that sometimes <sighs> come over you. But when you look at them with the eyes of your heart, you take them in your arms and you try to love them back to you. In your marriage. Sometimes when you look at your wife or your husband, if you only look with the eyes of your mind, oh brother, pretty soon you will have no wife or no husband. But when you look with the eyes of your heart, you come to different conclusions. What Paul is saying, that reality I want to be now enhanced by the Holy Spirit enlightening the eyes of your heart. Yes, the transformation of the mind is crucial, absolutely crucial. It's important, it's vital to see the reality, the mere and the bare reality. It's crucial, otherwise you don't know what needs to be changed, how to guide reality, how to make the right directions, how to make the right choices in your life. You don't know. But there is a way of looking at reality among the saints when your eyes, the eyes of your heart are enlightened by the Holy Spirit and you can see hope like Abraham who hoped against all hope. You can see richness, the richness of his glorious inheritance in the saints. A richness that many times seems so dusty and rusty or like a fading glory. And you can also see the power of the power of the power of His power, the power of resurrection. I pray for myself and for you that by the transformation of the Holy Spirit, our eyes, the eyes of our hearts will be enlightened and we will know, we will know the hope of his call. We will know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And we will see that resurrection power. The power of the power of the power of his power working. Amen. Mm -hmm.